Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. This is a pre-COVID recording and a post-COVID release. Woo! So everything's changed. We're not talking about viruses, and we're actually sitting pretty close to each other. We're not doing any social distancing. So just chill out, man, because we got Steve Byrne, 38 years in the game from FSG, man, Facility Solutions Group. Love talking to those guys, Greg, the old guys in the game. Yeah. I mean, Steve, you're not old, but we love you, whatever that means. We love yeah, the guys that sure. have lots of experience in lighting. Impressive company. They're all over the country and, and had a great discussion with them. This yeah. This is a good one. Yeah. It's a, you know what, man? I'm so glad you're back in Nailed. Love you. Need you, man. Thanks for FSG for coming back in. And that's NAILD.org. Baby, that's Nailed.org. Everybody's joining. The party's starting. Even though the, this post-COVID world, everything got canceled and blah, we're gonna We're still building this thing, man. We're not backing down. So go to NAILD.org. Baby, that's Nailed.org. And... What you can't forget about coming straight out of Chicago, right at you. The specification grade kings made in the USA, Greg. Kurt's on. Go to K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, Greg. Now we're talking clean rooms. Now that's something that might be a hot topic Ooh. right now with all that's going on. You're going to need a lot of clean rooms. So what happens when you go in a clean room right now? A lot of times you see, what type of fixture do you see in fluorescent, Mike, if you could recall, in a, in a clean room, typical? I would say you have a four lamp T8 uh, surface smell, one of those ones that you you maintain from the back, and you I don't know what yep. they call those things, but what yeah, kind of what kind of lens? What kind of lens? It's like a clear one with some usually some sort of wire mesh through it, so it does if you smash it, it doesn't sure. get broken. Yeah, yeah, or, or prismatic, right? It's just a flat sheet. Sure, sure. What does that usually mean? It's glary and it doesn't look real nice and all that. Mm. All new LED is going what direct indirect center basket <sighs> style. Yeah. So what does Kurtz on do? Come on. They do a clean room center basket troffer. You can see it on screen here. Uh, now the specification Ooh. grade, one by four, two by two, two by four center basket, clean room troffer. Different Kelvin temperatures that you expect. All the you, every option that you can ask for, Kurtz on. You does. know what? Just because it's a clean room doesn't mean it has to be without style. Come on, man. You can have a stylish clean room that looks hot. Looks good. And you know where you go to get the fixtures? You go to the specification grade Kings. Straight out of Chicago. Made in the USA. Go to K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby. That's Kurtzon.com. And for right now, come on, man. We got FSG, Steve Byrne, coming on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Thanks, Steve. Listen to this, folks. Hello, Steve. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to uh, sit down with Get a Grip Online. Glad to be here. How long have you been with uh, FSG? Uh, this is all I've done my whole career, so since 1982. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. How <laughs> long is that? That's got to be, Third, that's from the beginning. Coming up on 38 years this year. So. Wow. And you started as American Lights? Is that yeah. What we, when we first uh, began, it was American Light Bulb and Supply Company, Inc., and uh, we opened up in San Antonio. In 1982, Bill Graham, our CEO, uh, was a, a distributor sales rep for, at that time, it was called Norelco. Mm -hmm. And Norelco became Phillips or was part of Phillips. And he saw a real opportunity in the marketplace uh, for lighting distributors because at that time, a lot of lighting was just sold across the counter of anybody that had a lighting distributorship. And he was actually going to uh, open up for another company in San Antonio, and he got the opportunity to do it on his own. He found somebody that would sort of back him. And uh, I was at his house one night. We were friends. We met him in college. And I was in my last semester of school at UT, and uh, we were driving home. He had, he had said he was going to start his own business, and we were driving home. And I said to my wife, well, if he does that, I'd you know like to see if he needs any help. Yeah. Called him the next morning. I didn't know anything about lighting and he said yeah i need somebody in the warehouse so that's where it began so you started in the warehouse yeah what's your role now uh i run the lighting business for fsg so oh, okay. I'm general manager for lighting what percentage of your revenue is lighting uh right now it's about probably 30 percent of the total of okay. what we do so what else do you guys do okay so the uh the business is it's lighting and electrical uh -huh. so we do lighting distribution supplies mro replenishment projects fixture packages for that's the daily 
product side of the business. The other side is the electrical contracting. So that's FSG. It's all FSG now, mm -hmm. but we do contracting all around the country, both uh, break and repair, maintenance, service, and new construction and build. So uh, all in about 2,500 employees and the vast majority of those work in that electrical field. So you guys, uh, any electrical job you do is FSG, you don't subcontract out or anything? No, we, we uh, so FSG does electrical jobs. Where we do <clears throat> work with subcontractors is in our kind of our national account group sure. where we don't self-perform. We, we like to self-perform wherever we can, but in when we're working in parts of the country where we don't have staff, we have an approved affiliate network that yeah. we engage with there and work with them. How so, many locations do you guys have? About 30. So I lose track of the Northeast every <laughs> once in a while because mm. they they tend to expand. Sure. So oh, you, man. you got the whole country just about covered at this point. Yeah, we go from, you know, LA to um, New York City. So you find it a little different in every market? It is. Uh, but there, there there's a lot that's the same. Business mm -hmm. is done the same, so it's just it's the personalities. You have to manage and deal with and Yeah. Yeah. And, and a little bit of the product. Though if you're talking lighting, I'm assuming you're seeing it in different markets that certain people like a certain type of fixture or style. Yeah. Rebate based, whatever it might be. The the larger the, the east and west coast markets are kind of a lot more on the front edge and and doing things we see things there before maybe we see it in other parts of the country. So sure. And how are you staying up to date on lighting? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's been the hardest. You need thing. to help us. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that, that's been the hardest thing. So it, I, I, I find myself uh, frustrated because 30 years of learning traditional lighting and the sure. old sources and, you know, really love that stuff. It's kind of all out the window. So yeah. solid state came in and turned everything on its ear. And, um, that's that's a new learning curve almost daily. This is what it's felt like over the last seven years. I was thinking about that a lot this mm -hmm. morning. Is that's come in and uh, it's afforded thousands of more options. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> thousands of more competitors, mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot more complex. It's a thousand times more complex, and that's impacted everything from how long it takes to get fixtures on a project to kind of. <laughs> the user making up his mind as to which option he wants to take. So hmm. It's uh, it's challenging. So we, you know, you, you try and stay up with industry journals. You, you uh, we get, I mean, first you got to listen to the get a grip on lighting podcast. <laughs> That's right. You, you guys <laughs> got to stay current with you guys. What's happened in the last 10 years in this industry? Like, it, it, you know, it's, it's almost like, and I, I want to preface this before you answer, but so we, we're going to talk to people. And, you know, if, if I said to you, 10 years ago that there be, wouldn't be a GE Phillips or Sylvania. Okay. Yeah. That, you know, um, uh, that, uh, the, the, uh, the socket was disappearing, right? This kind of stuff. You would have said it was crazy. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. no chance. And you know what, what's going on with it? Like what, this has been the most disrupted industry I think in the world in the yeah. last 10 years. Digital disruption. It, you know, solid state sort of changed everything. And to your point, if you would have, because for a long period of our existence, it was, it was the big three. No matter what you did in the marketplace, they were still prevalent 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. GE, Ajram, and Phillips. You had to have one of those in your pocket or you couldn't, you yeah. couldn't be in the business. And who would have thought they don't even have the same name anymore. Yeah. So that's all turned on its ear. They've all been sold or spun off or under new management. Sure. And they make acquisitions. So so that's been a, a, a sea change in that there's no such thing as the big three anymore. Uh, in it, So there's more competition, more competitors. Um, and then it's, I'd say it's these innovative young people that understand technology that mm. took LED and said, we're going to do all these cool things with it. And mm -hmm. they started changing fixtures. So industry and lighting is still a really great place to be. I, I think there's more lighting opportunity today than we ever even dreamed of 10 mm -hmm. years ago as to what was out there. So, so that's the exciting part of it. Uh, but it has, it's turned everybody on their ear in terms of, boy, who are your relationships with? And, you know, what do you take to market and who are you up against? So the channel was disrupted, significantly disrupted. But you know, when I was at the NED event, which is 
know, distributors. Mm-hmm. And now they're electrical guys. We're, we're, I'm a nailed guy, but you know, those are distributors. And by the way, wonderful organization. Um, but you look at that and you, see, you look at that. And I think we're seeing the re what's the right word. The channels being put back together. I would agree. I, I, I believe we're entering what I hope would be called a period of stabilization. So <laughs> all of this stuff is, or, or maybe disruption is just the new normal and we're all getting used to it. But, but I do think that uh, distribution is distribution's never going away. That's, that's going to be a big part of it. Um, when solid state first came in, you know, all of the wild promises, 25 years, you never change it. So these sockets mm-hmm. are just going away. Well, that didn't happen. And yeah. it's, it changes every three years, just, almost kind of like the old stuff. So uh, there's going to be a need for that. And then the other thing I think is the complexity of the products themselves requires new levels of expertise. And so there's still this opportunity for people that can be experts around products and product lines, that there's a real need for that in the marketplace. I think there's more of a need than ever. You keep, you've you've said complexity probably three or four times in this conversation, right? And it's interesting because complexity introduces introduces cost. Mm -hmm. The more complex something is, the more it costs. And that's, I think that's what, you know, what distributors would do lighting distributors, because you guys have a lighting background is you would kind of separate the signal from the noise for the end user. Like, uh, well, I want to buy this F32 T8 XPS dash 841K. Yeah, it's an 841K T8. You want to buy G Phillips oil, which one you want? Yeah. It's all the same thing, right? We kind of, and yeah, you know, some guys were GE guys or whatever, but most of the time you're kind of like, you're helping the customer pick. I think that's going to go on steroids now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think that, I think that that product knowledge is going to be so important in the next 10 years. And then you start, you know, you start to introduce things like circadian, mm-hmm. um, and you start to introduce the, uh, the, uh, the, the world of connected and, and, uh, controls and it, it, that is, uh, by a magnitude, that complexity yeah. it's by a magnitude. Yeah. It's well, we, I mean, we see it. If you think about what used to be the world of ballast, right. Is now drivers, programmable drivers sure. and what driver are you going to pair with whatever led system that they have out there? Mm-hmm. And I think that's where there's, there's a spot for, for distribution to really thrive in, in kind of those areas is the, they're, they're and I don't know, maybe they're going to become even more niche in, in that they're going to be so specialized because of that sure. complexity around those product lines. You can't know everything. Sure. So you have to be really good at the things that you do know. And uh, mm. so there's an opportunity there. And I think there's the other role that distribution can play is this opportunity for integration of, of bringing those things together. Mm-hmm. And that probably makes partnerships even more critical in the supply chain, you know, mm-hmm. your relationships with your manufacturers, your end users and your, you know, and, and the distributor themselves, that supply chain communication has to be pretty um, robust mm-hmm. to, to deliver successful projects. So. so with the big three being gone, do you feel that brand matters? In terms of manufacturing? We had this, that conversation came mm-hmm. up yesterday in mm-hmm. a meeting is, is, uh, and it came up in the context that we were reporting on something with some key vendors and we said, this is what we're experiencing. And I'm just going to be generic with vendor X here. Sure. Yep. Uh, and this is what we're experiencing with vendor Y. And it was, uh, it was not cooperative, right? Sure. It, it was almost conflicted, but here's vendor Z that is jumping through hoops and bending over backwards to try and gain more of our business. And when you look at vendor Z, they have a really good product line that complements a lot of the kind of activity mm-hmm. that we do. And you have somebody saying, we really want to partner with you. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's the change, you know, and I, I think alliances like that are going to be important as they go forward. And, um, so, and that may not involve the big three. Sure. So. How do you how do you guys evaluate who you're going to work with in terms of a manufacturer? That's a in FSG's world. There's a couple of things that are uh, challenging relative mm-hmm. to that. So being in 30 markets, yeah. there's still the importance and value of uh, local relationships, local agencies, and the things that they're doing there. So you have to be connected there, and. There's been a commonality across a lot of markets of maybe it's not the big three, but say the big seven of fixture manufacturers, that type of thing mm-hmm. that were dominant in there. And you'll see them pop up everywhere. So you you have to respect that and you have to work with that. And that's 
how we go to market is that our local markets have a lot of autonomy around that in terms of what they do. But then our national play and the things that we do for, for national accounts and roll out there, that's different. And that's a lot more <clears throat> of a, uh, what I would say, factory direct relationships where you're working with, you, you, you get involved with their sort of forecasting and their their sourcing of components and stuff to, to make sure that the supply chain is going to run smoothly if you're trying to roll something out. And, you you know, who you end up partnering with is, is what works, right? Sure. The, the people that actually deliver, do what they said they were going to do and, yeah. you know, and, and, and stand behind what they – it's sold to you so so you guys have national account reps do you also have regional or yeah so our our markets are every market that we have will have a group of sales reps in the market and that's mm -hmm. that's still that's always been our our primary path to market is through a direct sales force yep. that's maybe changed some in latter years because as you as you get some scale you get a little word of mouth and some Sometimes people come to you and ask you to do things, which yeah. is is nice. But uh, local markets are uh, built around a sales force, but there are also um, a group of sales reps that are focused on national opportunities. But local markets can pursue the national opportunities in their markets as well. Sure. So we, we think that's uh, enterprise accounts is what we would call them are, are a big part of um, what we want to focus on. Nice. So. What is your stance on purpose-built fixtures versus modular or replaceable parts, tubes or kits or fixtures? You know what I mean by that? Hmm. That's, a, that's a good one. I kind of like purpose-built because you really got to be engaged with the user mm -hmm. on that when it's purpose-built and you're, you're really getting into their thinking and what they're doing with their business. But the modular part of it, that's – Sort of how our old world worked, right? Yeah. That, that was more modular. Yeah. From a pure distribution standpoint, if all I have to do is buy it, stock it, ship it, and sell it, I like that yep. better. But so I, I think you have to do both. Yeah, so. it really comes down to what the customer wants. You have to lay out both options, and yeah. you can explain it all. But at the end of the day, what they want, the, we sell. This one, of, I think, one of the challenges with the modular part now is it, it's still. It, it seems to be aligned in a purpose-built fashion. So there's not a lot of interchange, you know, uh, with components X really fit well and component Y mm. and, and trying to convince the user component X will work in component Y. Mm. What are you seeing from national accounts? Because you're doing multiple chains across the country. Are they leaning towards uh, purpose-built or are they leaning towards that or is it a mix? The, the spec is important. Or does the end user know? Like, are you telling them what to do? Uh, well, we want wherever we can be the trusted advisor and, mm -hmm. and do that and, and shed light and influence kind of their final decision. Because what we hope is is that they do come to us for that for for the sure. lighting knowledge, and so where we can do that, we like that. Uh, but they will have so there's a, a lot of other people involved in that. There's architects, there's lighting designers, mm -hmm. there's the contractors, there's the and then ultimately the user. Those all uh, play a role in that. So um, we want to influence where we can, but when the decision is made, this is what we're going to do, that's sort of a, a look and feel that that user wants in their facility. They want mm -hmm. it to be this certain way. So I think design, lighting design is, is um, probably there's more opportunity and more on the forefront there than there's ever been in the past just because of the so many different options and ways that you can do it yeah have you guys do you break your business down in terms of uh lighting side like projects and supply yes is what i call it you know just selling light bulbs or selling a project yeah so we were i would say heavily supply focused for a lot of years and it was kind of almost in concert when the industry shifted with solid state and led and I, I think everybody's felt this traditional supply started doing this yep. and everything was becoming a project. So what that did was disrupt. You didn't know what in the world to stock anymore because yeah. you, you didn't, you didn't want to stock it's like anything. a hot potato. Yeah. It, it was, you, you were caught with it yeah. at the end of the year. Yeah. So you didn't want to stock anything. And so you really wanted to understand clearly and get commitments from, okay, what do you want? What are you going to do? So, so that's been, a change so 
in in terms of our mix, it's that's been dramatic going from a, a supply MRO type of distributor to a very project focused. And it's and it shifted the. When did that start? Did that start with uh, high efficiency T eights and T fives and stuff like that? That was a, that was. A, or did it start with LED? High efficiency T eights and T fives. I'd say maybe that was. I was unaware of it at the time, but that was the transition. So, yes. so that was that was retrofit. So you were still dealing with components, yes. you know. So you're doing a lot of retrofits, but everything was staying in the ceiling. Sure. You were just changing out sort of the guts, and there was a ton of that done. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of that around the country but that was that thinking is what led to okay here's solid state and oh my gosh it lasts 10 years and it uses you know 20 percent of the energy and you turn it off it doesn't use any energy mm -hmm. and uh all of that promise started coming in and it made people think about well maybe i don't want to just change tubes i want to put in new fixtures or i want to do my lighting differently in the space and make it mm -hmm. you know create a different look so have you guys been getting into the online business at all? We uh, that that's the other side of distribution, right? Yeah. Is, is is what's going to happen in the online world? So I would say our online activity is what I would call B two B. So we yeah. we support our customers online, but having um, uh, a storefront for the world online, um, we're we're not you know that that's not a focus mm -hmm. right now. <clears throat> I think distribution probably needs to do both uh but there's there's some people that do online really really well and then you know you have the amazons of the world that <laughs> set, sure. set expectations for everybody about what an online experience should be like because your scope is you know ba the breadth of S fsg is quite substantial for a lighting company mm -hmm. right so you don't usually see companies like you're a you're a lighting contractor and a lighting distributor together right that's primarily what you guys do yeah. so um, your scope is quite big for a lighting company. You know, electrical comp electrical electrical distribution. You see that you see this type of thing all the time mm -hmm. across the country, and there's lots of them. You don't see it as much with lighting. Um, so I want to ask you though, because of that, uh, I don't in my market. I'm in Toronto. I don't hear the customers asking at all for IoT or circadian. <laughs> like they don't ask at all. Right. And the, uh, and I'm doing this podcast and I'm talking to scientists and everyone at this end is screaming about three, three, 30, 300. And, you know, we're going to impact people's health. And then I'm, I go back, I do the podcast and then I go back out and sell light bulbs and customers have no interest in this at all. And wake you up and put you to sleep. And yeah, no, I mean, so do you guys, do you guys feel any grassroots swelling for the circadian or the IOT? Um, IOT is louder than circadian. Yeah. I would say circadian we hear about that at a strategies and light sure. or at a light fair. It's got a lot of talk there. I'd say that's the, the scientists behind lighting are, are really looking at that. But um, I can't recall users. The closest we get is, is they want to talk about tunable white or RGB sure. and LED. And uh, I, I don't know that they've, that we know of anybody that's bought fully into boy, if, if you do this circadian lighting, my office staff's going to be more productive. I, I read about it in the journals. It seems like they're doing more of it in Europe. Sure. In here. You know what I find interesting about the whole thing? So right now that all the, the hot topic in lighting is either IOT or it's, it's circadian. Okay. Or, or health and wellness. And, um, I actually, when I, li and it, you know, I have the privilege of being a talk to, to, to top people about this because of the, the show. And, um, I actually have come to believe that the uh, connected or IOT and circadian are actually competing with one another mm. because circadian is about telling people how their light should be. And IOT is about giving people control over their light. Yeah. And people say, well, circadian needs IOT to be effective. But the, the whole push behind IOT is that you can have whatever you want, right? right? You want to dim it, you want to change color, you want to, whatever you want. Right, turn it off, turn it on, log onto your computer, and you can adjust your lights. Now, what I know about that is most people do it once and then forget about it. Yeah. Okay, but no, there's some people that like to fiddle around with their lights. I know that if my employees were fiddling around with their lights every day, I'd probably shut the system down. Right, <laughs> like you're not you're not spending five, 10, 20 minutes on your lighting every day, buddy. Get yourself a cup of coffee and get to work. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, you know, but you think of, like the the sales message of IoT and the sales message of circadian are not are not. Are, they're not conducive to one another. Yeah. 
That's well, that. That's an interesting thought. Uh, maybe they are bumping heads. Yeah, but to- I think is is FSG going to walk into someone and say, "We are going to improve your employee your employee's health and vitality by fifteen percent or ten percent or five? Are we? Are you going to be saying that in five years? I don't know what we're going to be saying Ooh, in five years. Man, like think uh, about that's like that's kind of snake oily to me. You know, like <laughs> want to buy the letter I. You know, I, I mean, do you remember? Do you remember Full Spectrum? Remember mm-hmm. that? That's not even a real thing, right? Full yeah. Spectrum is not even a thing. It's just like a marketing term, really. There was a, a, a lot of that sold. Yeah, so. like oh, we're gonna we're gonna cure your seasonal affected disorder. That was the late nineties right. health and wellness with these five thousand KT twelves. Yeah. You know. Um, I don't know. I, I just, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if the uh, IOT and the other thing I, I wonder about is why do lighting people think that lighting is going to be the base station of the IOT? Like there's this acceptance in the lighting community that we're in charge of the IOT. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think that's just the prevalence of the chip is, yeah. is what that's about. And the fact that chips can, not only transmit, but they can receive. Mm. So they become a, a information piece. And so I think that's the, 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 the big deal there. And because light sources are so prevalent, they're, mm. they're every pervasiveness. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that's probably what's behind that. You know, I've, I don't, I've heard a little bit about Li-Fi is, is sure. even better than Wi-Fi, And, and so, you know, there's all this potential around what the light source can do. And I think that's where the controls people jumped in, the building automation people jumped in. They said, we've got all these digital assets all over Mm -hmm. the place and we can talk to it. We can get information from it. What do we do with this? I think that's still, uh, there's, I'll use my word again, a lot of complexity behind making that work. And then somebody has to sort of operate it after it's there in place. And that, you know, we, we hear a lot about controls and the promise of controls. Yes. And I even at one of the last events that I was at, because I, I was asking that question to a lot of the manufacturers, tell me about controls because we just hear, oh, you got to be into the controls. And they said, well, the reality is, is, I mean, it is growing, but if you took the, the talk and noise about controls and then the actual delivery of controls, it's it's not connected yet. No. It's, it's a lot smaller. And then... Most control projects are exactly what you said earlier. They, it does all of these things, and then it's there. And three weeks after the system's installed, the user calls and says, "I just want to turn my lights off at night. Can yes. you tell me how to do that?" Yes, exactly. I just want them off because <laughs> yes. they're on twenty four seven now. Yeah, so. you know. You, you, so how many um, how many um, lighting control systems are there out there deployed already that nobody uses? Yeah, I mean. That's a problem. I mean, you have, I mean, you have people that I have customers that are, you know, large malls and they have $2 million lighting control system. And nobody knows how to use it. Right. The company's not even, it doesn't even exist anymore. That the guy that first got trained on it left. Yeah, exactly. And nobody knows how to use it. They just override everything. Yeah. It, it, it's um, so I, I've seen, and I call it the control boom bus cycle <laughs> comes around every five to seven years. And my first one was dual technology. Yeah. Oh, the P- PRI with uh, passive infrared with ultrasonic or microphonic. <laughs> now we got it. Now we got it. Right. And then the second one was like that I seen because I, I started in, in by basically the year 2000. So they came out with the dual tech, right? Wow, microphonics. And, and then there was Intilium in that crowd, right? Yeah. That we're going to, we're going to cat five everything up. Right. And then that'll be that what it is. And then bust. Yeah. Right. And it's not a, it's like the, the excitement and this is going to take, now we're in another one with the IOT. And it's like, I don't know if people want to alert. I call it a Christmas present when Greg was telling me about it. Collating controls are like a Christmas present. <laughs> yeah. You know, you get it, you open it up. Wow. Thanks. And then you forget about it. <laughs> you re-gift, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like everyone's great when they first open the present. Nobody's like, this sucks. But it's like, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad I have control over my lights now. Yeah. So are you guys doing a lot of, uh, kind of back to what Michael was talking, are you doing a lot of controls? or are you we, just- we, we see, so controls get asked about more and more they are on, on the projects. Yeah. We yep. see a lot of projects that go in with controls and, and, you know, we have a whole group, a smart buildings group that focuses on controls and uh, sort of doing that. It's um, very 
<laughs> there's a lot of different systems that people want to talk to one another in there. Mm -hmm. and that's all kind of customized in terms of how that has to work. Um, so, What's the information that everybody wants to know? I think they want to know if they've got lights on that shouldn't be on that are burning at hours when nobody's occupying there. I think they want to know if I got vacant conference rooms when mm -hmm. you get into big spaces. Um, and then th that would be sort of the lighting stuff. Beyond that, the, the idea of controls is everything from, you know, how hot is the coffee in a pot at a, you know, convenience store to sure. are my soup temperatures right in a restaurant, that kind of thing. And that, that's all the noise and promise of controls. Mm -hmm. It'll do all of those things. Some of them want the um, RGB mm -hmm. type stuff, the, you know, the ability. The tunability and that. Yeah, so. Have you I, seen any LED to LED retrofits at this point in our projects? Yeah. Uh, well, we would call That's an it, exciting question, actually. Yes. Uh, first, second, third generation. So early adopters, you know, folks that were out there on the cutting edge that embraced LED when it first hit the market. And there were some of them that did that in a big way. Some of them are already on their third cycle. Are they so, mad about it? Are they mad? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, you know, they're, they're completely... Uh, sold on the technology yeah. so, so they like the led technology and because it's improved so much from where they were when they early adopted and then they the realization sat in that it's not 10 years it's not 25 years or whatever it is yeah. and you do start seeing things change in three to four years mm. it's time for that so so that cycle continues and I, the products are, are great today i, I think I think about CFLs when they first came sure. to market, and if you remember the the first CFLs, they were crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, remember the kits you'd put together with these reflectors and <laughs> reflector yeah, pin yeah, base, a yeah, screw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're plugging it all in, and I mean, there there was some fifty bucks. Yeah, there was some crazy components that people were putting together sure. and saying this is going to replace the incandescent light. And he said, "Well, it, it does, but it looks horrible." Yeah, and, sure. And it's, I got to maintain three or four things now. That. The time frame that it took from CFLs to get from that sort of um, <laughs> ugly start to at the end of CFLs' lives, they looked like A lamps, they looked like PARs, sure. they looked like reflectors, they were more efficient, but they were still CFLs. Sure. There was a lot of, you know, <laughs> color distortion, that type of thing. That was a longer time frame than what LED did. So LED started out in there. In, in, it was an evolution rather than a, than a, than a, a disruption. Yeah. So LED was maybe a little clunky at first, but it got better faster. Yes. Really fast. And I mean, some really good stuff out there today. So now we've um, got a recycling guy here, but what do you guys do when it's LED right now? And every market, are you having to re, uh, recycle the LED when you take it out? Some, yeah, some customers, that's, that's very important to customers that want to, you know, do the, the right thing is, you know, corporate citizens and, and be green and sustainable and all of that. So, so they require it and request it. And, and we sort of let them drive that because they don't always need it. As far as I understand, it's yeah. e-waste. I've, e I've yeah. heard mixed opinion. Like some people say, no, you don't really need to recycle it. I know you want to recycle it, but no, it's, it, actually need to? Uh, it's just, it's electronic waste. Mm -hmm. It's no different than, well, it's a little bit different in, in that it's, than a cell phone is a tighter, more complex product, but it, it's got a it it's got chips. It's got whatever. It's just e-waste. Yeah. All of those. And it's very low value anyway. It's almost worthless. It's, an, it's probably as, an, as the, the, the first generation of LED tubes say, lots of aluminum. Mm -hmm. So lo there's post, uh, post com um, consumer value to it in the form of scrap metal. Mm -hmm. um, the new LED tubes, there's almost nothing to them. Yeah. You, pull it, you know what I mean? It's like a piece of plastic or glass and a little tiny thing inside of it. And like that's that has negative value like a fluorescent tube it's yeah. it's a, it's not it's not an asset it's a liability but you know you got to do something with it there's going to be a lot of them we don't want to put them in landfill yeah so now are you guys exploring the other avenues other than lighting like solar are you getting into that or are you looking into it we've had some we've we've had some activity with solar so okay. um and that was one that that was you know it's largely driven by subsidy if mm -hmm. the, if the subsidy and rebates and you know, the utilities and agencies aren't pumping money into it. Users weren't quite ready to jump onto that. So uh, we kind of stuck our toe in it a little bit and we've, we've integrated it or accommodated where they need it. But it's not, 
it's not core yet. No, I don't know if it will be. And that's what I keep wondering because, you know, there's a lot of solar companies that are popping up and, but they're doing primarily residential. Mm -hmm. They're talking to commercial and then they get talking to them and yeah, 20 year payback, $5 million. No, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Yes. You know, power needs to be generated and distributed. You know, this idea that people, so I lived on a farm. Okay. And I, in my house, um, uh, was like 2005 state of the art. Okay, so at geothermal heating and cooling. Okay, so people, when I tell people that geothermal is just electric heating, <laughs> I tell people this and like, huh? No, you get, no, you got to have a giant pump in your house that runs off electricity. Okay, yeah, you're electrically heating your home. <laughs> yeah, okay, there's it's not lava underground in my house. Okay, <laughs> you know, it's like, like it's and it costs a lot to run that pump. And I don't know if it's if it's more or less than baseboards or whatever, but. Yeah. It was expensive to run that pump 24 seven in the winter. Okay. <laughs> so you're electrically yeah. heating your home. The idea that people are going to generate their own electricity and they're going to, what are they going to do next? Uh, handle their own sewage too. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're going to go back to septic tanks and, and you know, like complete recycle. Come on. Yeah. I mean, we need to, we need to create, we need to utilities here. Here's my message to you. We're done with energy efficiency and lighting now. We're, we're going to have more energy. We're going to start taking back some of the energy we've saved so we can give people really cool lighting systems. And utilities, you have to make clean energy for us yeah. so that we can use as much of it as we want. You know what I mean? We like energy. Yes. <laughs> energy is what makes love, life amazing. Yeah. It's why people want to move to America yeah. from India because there's no energy. They don't have access to electricity. Yeah. You understand what I mean? That, like that is the problem. Yeah. You want to know what the problem with Africa is? Nobody has any electricity. <laughs> you know that Come that's the problem. Oh, how come they don't have how come that economic growth is so slow? No electricity. Oh, okay. You mean you can't just plug your phone in? No. Yeah. No, you gotta build uh you have to have a diesel generator or solar panel. It starts getting complicated. No, we need the we need strong utilities with clean energy. And people can just plug in and then have to worry about where it comes from, how it's made, generating it, or anything else. Just plug in. So if we can figure out how to stream that, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> so ticket. Now you guys, so you're, you're dealing with a lot of national accounts. Mm-hmm. Are you um, the group relamping was a big thing when it was fluorescent? Are you planning on that? Uh, great question. We uh, we we've had some clients that have done that. Did, they plan uh, out that, and it's again, it was those early adopters that sure. maybe they got through generation one and they said, okay, this you know. 500 locations is it's all kind of going out at the same time so let's go back in and change it to the newer generation and put that in so. how about the people you're talking to today like are you saying let's plan for seven years from now or 10 years or is it not really what are you discussion? gonna do take out the fixtures and throw them out That's yeah the the, I, I don't think the um just my sense is is the group relamp conversation is not the same as it was back in the days of traditional lighting. Sure. It was, it was a, that was a good selling point yeah, for back sure. in those days. Group relamping made so much sense to everybody in the world of fluorescent. Like yeah. if you had enough fluorescent fixtures, you just like, oh, we're not spot relamping in this. That's right. good. It's, that made so much sense. Yeah. Maybe you do floors, you wouldn't do the whole building, but you do, you had some sort of strategy for it. You're right. There just doesn't, when you talk to customers, they don't, there's, I think, I don't know if the, um, if that snowballs rolled all the way down the hill yet. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Okay, we're in the snowball now of like going down the hill and yeah, these things burn up. <laughs> well, and that's you know because the, there's been so many LED tube retrofits that have gone in sure. with that. But I, I just I think when that comes up, users are now more in a mindset of let's look at what other options are there, and maybe that's a fixture, or maybe that's you know a different way of lighting that space. So, hmm. well, you know, it's funny because. Um, uh, this is another paradox in the lighting business. We've increased the um, life of the source, but decreased the life cycle of the fixture. Mm. So the life cycle of a two by four troffer with T12 is 40 or 50 years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, we still, we still pull out PCB ballast sometimes. Right. You know what I'm okay, saying? Yeah. I get it. Now right? it's, it's like, I don't want two by four. I want one by three. Yeah, exactly. And now it's like, so now that there's the, the life cycle of the fixture might be like, let's say you have a, a really good purposeful fixture. Mm-hmm. Best case scenario is 10 years. And then you're taking that thing out. 
which that's exciting, right? You like that? In lighting, I, that, that's exciting for lighting because selling fixtures is fun. Is a lot more fun than sure. getting your brains beat out over an F thirty two and three. Do you remember cents. how my, you remember how like we used to argue about ten cents on a tube oh, and stuff yeah, like that? For sure, two cents. <laughs> oh it was, man, that was. People lived and died by that. I know. It was, oh like selling eight nineteens, and it's like oh, thirty nines at thirty eight and a half. <laughs> yeah. I need another spa. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh man, so. Steve, we spoke almost forty minutes now. <laughs> Good. Good. I really enjoyed that. It was really fun to speak to you and yeah. gain some of your knowledge and and that. And so, thank you for being a guest. Well, I, I appreciate it. It's it's been enlightening for me too. So, Good. thank wow. you. Thanks for and congratulations on for uh, almost forty years. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Keep wow. it going. All right. We'll try. And you Great. out there, thanks for listening. Thank you. All right. Kurtzon.com. That's K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby. The specification. Great kings bringing style and love and life to the clean room. That's right. An application that doesn't have a lot of that right now. We talked about before. It's typically just a prismatic lens, nasty-looking troffer. This one's got the center basket style, which everybody's doing now when you go new LED. That's the right fixture. It's got the best look, the best light output. And now they put it in clean rooms. One by four, two by two, two by four, all the Kelvin temperatures you could ask for, universal voltage, all the different options. Hurts on, knocks it out again. I, you know what? Keep in lighting hot and fun. There's nothing boring at boring at Kurtz on, man. They're another one that's just cranking in on the curve. So you got to go to the specification grade kings, K U R T Z O N dot com, man. I got to get off my phone when I'm doing these ads, man. Holy mackerel. I had to turn it off real quick. I almost had a call coming in right in the middle of the ad. And I'm talking about Kurtz on. Keep in light. They're, you know what? They're, they're staying away from the boring. There's no reason why a clean room should be boring. With its lighting, it should be crisp, clean, and awesome. So go to Kurtzon.com. That's K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby. And the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. We got someone out. You may, they, it already may be out. You may have already heard the news by this time. But something's coming out that's going to be clean and hot from us. Virus-free, but fun as heck. We're going to do it. Hopefully. Greg. Save me. It. I'm drowning over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying yeah, we don't know yet. So let's just let's just tease it like that and see what oh, happens. Oh, like, man. I hope, these, I hope the board, we're talking on the board today in a couple hours. Yep. So today's what, March the 19th, March the 20th. So we're talking on the board in a couple hours. And, guys, woo, it's, uh, hopefully it's going to happen. So lots of fun things coming at Nailed. You know, you got you know, what everybody's joining, it's getting so busy at Nailed. They don't even want to be there anymore, Greg. Used to have, I used to know everybody in Nailed. Now I'm to have to new get get all the new peeps in. Can't wait to meet. Uh, you know, can't wait till we can have another convention and we can actually meet each other and maybe shake hands. I don't know if that's going to be off the table at that point, man. But you never know. Let's see where it goes. I we might have shook hands for the last time, boy. I'll still kiss you though. Thanks for listening, folks. Written on the rectory wall, there's a sign there for all. If you are lost, the Lord is there to find you.